Thanks for joining us on this first episode back of Against the Mountains of Madness. John and I thought this week we'd talk about always coming home, the story of how we wound up in the Catholic Church. So John, I guess I'll go first. Go right ahead. Um, so how, where did you start out with first? So where did I did start? You, so what I put was, your foot on the path? No, that's fair. So I... I was raised an agnostic by my parents. I mean, they sent me to Sunday school a little bit to get some teaching, some morals, but my parents uh, aren't, aren't church-going individuals. My parents are great. I love my parents. Um, like, I'm, I'm not going to say anything bad about them, but um, they, they didn't raise me in any particular religious tradition. And in my teen years, in the typically... Um, self-assured and angsty way that only a teenager can i became an atheist um i thought i was wise wise and and smart to have this shallow and childish insight and <laughs> that's maybe too harsh um and i tried to live like that uh through my teen years from from about sort of 14 or 15 to age 18 um I was cursed, you might say, with a somewhat um, reflective spirit, and I discovered, unsurprisingly, um, the life. The a atheism is completely unlivable, shall we say? Mm -hmm. um, there's no meaning, no purpose, no nothing to existence. No, no point to existence. No point to life. You could say you. I would. I suppose I would comfort myself with the uh, with the idea of um, meaning is what you make it, or life is what you make of it, and you can invent your own meaning. Um, my marijuana use would suggest that that wasn't working for me uh, particularly well, um, but that was that was rough. But you know, um, and a friend, a friend from uh, high school uh, in year twelve, uh, doing my. HSC, which I think is similar to your SATs, it's basically the exam mm -hmm. you take at the end of school and you use it for university admission. Right. Um, a friend from school uh, who I had mocked on, uh, James, who I'd mocked on a number of occasions for being a Christian, ironically enough, uh, invited me to church. Um, and there were girls there, so I went. <laughs> I also, I I'm, I am I am definitely not the only person that has done that. Uh, and then at my first night uh, going to church for the first time, which was a weird experience, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Um, they were all talking about how they were off for a week to a study camp to study for the HSC and invited me along. And and this was like the following day. Um, and I rang my parents and discussed it and they were like yeah that's fine because you need to study for the hsc and that'll be good for you so here i was 18 years of age with a bunch of complete strangers going off to a study camp with a bunch of christians for the first time which included some bible study during the week and things like that which was all very weird and i i didn't know what was going on but um about midway through the week i um because there was a quiet reflection time and I had taken to wandering off into the nearby bush and sitting on a rock. And I was, I don't know why, but I was quietly sitting on a rock uh, trying to make sense of the book of Titus that we were studying that week and was struck by an overwhelming sense of all of this is true and you need to learn more. It was a... It was a weirdly profound experience. Um, and I sort of wandered into the bush, an atheist, I guess, and wandered out of the bush, convinced there was something to this, if not actually a Christian at that point, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And started going to church regularly and chasing it and studying it from there. Um, and that was an Anglican church. And... I was there for many years uh, until I met my first wife and we had a home break in and I dropped out of university and I needed a job and I had to work on Sundays. So I moved to her church, which had a later service that I could get to. Um, but yeah, that was how I 
became a Christian. Uh, that got me on the road. That strange, overwhelming experience in the bush. I, I don't, I mean, some people might interpret that as, oh, you know, it's a blind faith, you don't. But it's not that at all, because I've been driven to look into sort of the evidence and the history and make sense of it and make sure it's rational and reasonable. Yeah. It, it was just, I think it would be fair to say, I wasn't open to it, the idea of it being rational and reasonable until that time. And that sort of pushed me over the edge to actually seriously consider Christianity as a live option instead of dismissing it as all of the yeah. usual ridiculous nonsense you hear from atheists um, about it, you know, weak-minded and a crutch and false and made up and just all of the usual nonsense. Um, I am most familiar with that nonsense. So if you want to segue, I will tell how I became a uh, I became a Christian. Well, I was I was just gonna I was just gonna finish up. Go ahead. The the problem I guess the problem with uh, the way I came to Christ is at this point in time, whenever I hear people talking of being an atheist, and then they start they start talking about why, um, to my ears, it always sounds like you're an angsty teenager. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't know what they're talking about and i can't escape it, that it's just and i hate to say it it's often an angsty teenager who doesn't get along with his father that's not true in my case but that's true it's in a not lot true of cases. it's not true in my case either but they always so because of when i was an atheist and the sort of silly things i believed and the sorts of silly things i hear atheists say they always strike me as angsty childish teenagers and I, I can't help it because when I was an atheist, that was I was a childish, angsty teenager that believed all sorts of stupid things that have no bearing on reality. I didn't know what I was talking about, and I would talk, <laughs> I would blather on confidently about stuff I knew nothing about. I had no understanding of, and was dismissive of things I didn't understand. But yes. I mean, I guess that works for the devil. Greetings, world. This is John C. Wright. I and my compatriot, Jason Rennie, take up arms weekly against the mountains of madness that are afflicting and overwhelming the modern age. You are welcome here among like-minded souls, and I hope we have provided a work of insight, hope, or humor, and perhaps an explanation of the insanity that is the modern age. For more content and conversation on these and other fascinating topics of philosophy, science fiction, and current events, please visit our substack at atmom.substack.com. Tips, bribes, and generous patronage are warmly encouraged. Thank you. So Now, uh, in my case, I continued to be dismissive of things I didn't understand well into my 30s and, and 40s. So here's, here's, my, here's my story, if I, can, if I can keep it brief. So you're ten, my, Hang on, sorry. So you're 10 years older than me, but I've been a Christian longer than you. But you've been a Catholic yeah. longer than me. Anyway. <laughs> I, 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 may have, I may have misremembered the dates. I'm not good with no, that. No, no, that's fine. So I was um, raised in a Lutheran home. My parents were not particularly religious. Uh, at age seven, I was a very logical young tyke, and I asked my dad why we have to go to church and what the what the reasoning was behind it and why I had to wear a tie, because I figured if God was everywhere and omnipotent, he didn't need us to wear a tie. So to my surprise and, and enduring uh, uh, glory, I actually talked my dad out of going to church at age seven. Now... I asked him about this later. I said, there's no way a seven-year-old child could talk a grown-up out of anything. He said no, that he had been in grave doubts about the, the religious life for a long time. He was raised in an orphanage. His, his granddad became Lutheran only to get him into the orphanage, only because it was convenient. He didn't actually ever believe it oh. himself. And uh, dad just went through the motions because that was what was expected of him. He never actually thought about it. He was a very rational person, very pragmatic person, and his rationale and his prag pragmatism did not mesh well with the, with the uh, uh, Christians he met from rural Pennsylvania, for example. So we stopped going to church when I was seven. So I've been, I've, I was an atheist from that until quite recently. And I was not just your run-of-the-mill atheist. I was a vituperative, evangelizing, crusading atheist who was out to abolish superstition and the vexations of the Christians from, from all of life. Now, I have to say, I think I was, if I can blow my own horn, I think I was a little more rational about my atheism than most atheists are. Uh, pride was, of course, involved, as was teenage angstiness, and as was the 
thought that I knew what I was talking about, which I did not. <laughs> but it's either. You know what I'm saying? I didn't I didn't believe in Thor or Allah or or the the gods of the east or anything else. Uh didn't believe in anything supernatural. But to my credit, I also did not fall into the nihilism of believing that I didn't have free will or that there was no such thing as the moral code that runs the universe. If anything, I was I was someone who followed the code of the Stoics, whom I greatly admired, the ancient Romans who taught that you should always do your duty, whether it was to your benefit or not. And that the only thing you can control in life is your own emotions, your own mind, your own, your own passions. That you can't actually control whether you live or die, so you should hold that to be neutral. That should not concern you. You, should not, you can't control whether you're rich or poor, so that also should be of no, no, no great concern to you, you see. Now, at the same time, I was also raised to be a, a libertine kind of libertarian fellow who believed, as many of my generation did, that anything was licit as long as it did not harm another. Anything to which one consented was licit in the mm -hmm. sexual areas or anywhere else. So I had no problem with uh, homosexuality or uh, anything. Until a day came when my fellow atheists started going crazy on me. It was round after 9-11. And my fellow atheists, uh, four of them, became quite popular and famous. I would have been thrilled at any previous time to have popular and famous atheists, people on my side, because I felt quite alone. I thought I was the only atheist around, you see. And I didn't count Marxists because I thought they were basically religious. You know, that they, they, just did, they just had an atheist version of religion, but they were still, they were still mystical crackpots. They weren't logical. Yep. Well, my fellow atheists, who I thought had the hammerlock on logic, said, uh, any passion that you want to indulge, no matter what the consequences are, is licit. And I said, well, wait a minute. That's not what the Stoics say. The Stoics say do your duty whether you want to or not. They say control your emotions. Because I had been a big fan of, like, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. I wanted to be logical. I wanted to be a rational man because I thought re reason was the only way to understand reality. But my fellow atheists began to doubt whether reality existed. They talked with quite seriousness about how truth was relative and how morality was a matter of opinion or a matter of social conditioning. And I was like, I'm sorry, no one conditioned me. I, I don't obey the laws of so what society says is right or wrong. I follow my own, I follow my own course. Mm. Uh, my fellow atheists started to do things like they tried to get the unbelievably microscopic cross removed from the top of an image of a, a Spanish mission in the city seal of San Diego. And I was living in California at the time. I was born and raised in California. And if you know anything about California history, the Spanish missions were the people who colonized the, the place. Our, half our history is, is Spanish. Half the names of the cities are Spanish names. San Diego, Los Angeles, and so on and so forth. So for my fellow atheists to want to remove that because that would, what, cast a magic spell and turn us into Christians against our will? But I was an atheist. I didn't believe in magic. They wanted to get yeah. in God we trust off the money. I said, why? What, what does that matter to you at all? Unless you believe that symbols have power over people's minds. Unless you believe in magic, in magic words. So it just got worse and worse. So I began to, I began to so seriously ponder. And uh, I started reading C.S. Lewis to see if there was any merit to the Christian worldview. I started reading G.K. Chesterton. Now, at the time, I was living uh, with, a, with a coven of witches. And when I asked them about what they believed, about the afterlife, about the nature of morality, about the objectivity of truth, they gave me very uh, flaccid and unsatisfying answers. Like, they hadn't, really, like, hadn't thought about what happens with life after death. Like, it never crossed their mind. And I said, you know, and so my, my opinion of Christianity was absolutely rock bottom. I had, I, there was no one for whom I had more contempt. And I'm sorry to say that nowadays, but it was true. But after this conversation with some of my pagan friends, I realized that the Christians at least had a worldview. They at least knew the answer to the question of what happens when you die? Where does the good come from? Why is the universe coherent? Why is the universe all logically constructed? Where does beauty come from? Things like that, see? Mm -hmm. Now, I, the events came to a mental crisis with me because I realized that my libertine libertarianism and my stoicism could not coexist. You can't both say your emotions are paramount and say logic is paramount regardless of emotion, right? Of course. So, and I began to read people like C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton who did not hold that. They said God is paramount and reason and emotion have their, both have their roles within that, within that worldview. And I began to really like them. I fell in love with them because they seemed sane and normal and decent to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas my fellow atheists seemed like gibbering lunatics. I mean, poop-flinging poop monkeys. They seemed so bad. They didn't seem like me. They didn't seem like creatures of pure logic who didn't believe in God because there was insufficient evidence, or because we thought the, the or because the uh, 
the notion of God seems logically incoherent because how can you be benevolent and omnipotent and omniscient and allow for pain in the world? That doesn't seem logical. How can you be able to act if you can foretell the future? If you're omnipotent, wouldn't any action you perform be instantaneous to you? You know, why would you need to do anything since you could have everything you wanted instantaneously? And so on and so forth. What, what and I had all had, the same arguments. Oh. Sorry, I, was kind of I had all the same arguments that you've heard from all the atheists uh, uh, throughout, throughout time and space. Uh, I mean, it's not like I had a new atheist argument. There are no new atheist arguments. These are the same arguments being made in ancient Greece, <laughs> you know, in, in, uh, in 5th century BC. No, I saw um, the amazing atheist, amazing atheist, who's been around for years. Oh, one of the atheist YouTubers that used to be big, and uh, he posted a tweet that said, Christianity is nonsense. Islam is false. He was ruder than that. They were expletives. But he rubbished a bunch of religions and then someone asked, but females can have a penis? And he goes, yup. And so, is this, was this, would, this, would this be similar to what you're... Exp well, crazier probably nothing, than your experience. Nothing that. that. Nothing that extreme. But yeah. it was extreme enough for me to realize that my fellow atheists had lost their minds. They didn't believe in truth, logic, and reality. They yeah, thought reality that's... was optional. Okay? Yeah. They were nihilists, basically. Hmm. Or they were atheists because God didn't give them a pony when they prayed when they were young, which is not a reason that I regard as legitimate. Okay? <laughs> no, it's not. Or they simply told lies about the past. Uh, uh, like Christopher Hitchens, in order to support his atheism, simply has to make, make stuff up. That's not the way a logical person acts. That's not the way an honest person acts. That's not the way an honorable person acts. It's the way a power-seeking one does, though. It's the way a liar acts, okay? It's well, the way a man of despicable sure. man of no honor acts, okay? And it's not the way a Vulcan acts, because we do not say the thing which is not. The, the, that's not the way the Hwinnom <laughs> from Gulliver's Travels acts. We don't say the thing which is not. So events came to a head when I realized that my fellow atheists were preaching a form of sexual morality, and sex was, in the, was, in the, was the big topic of the, in, in my youth, uh, which didn't conform with reality. It didn't conform with... with prudent uh, self-regard it didn't conform with uh, family life mm -hmm. and you need families to raise kids because otherwise they're raised as orphans as my dad was and so i didn't need anyone to convince me that families are better than non-families okay so i talked to two of my friends who were christians both of them said sex outside of marriage was licit and allowable one of them said if you love the person if you love your partner if you love your mate and the other one said not the other one said it's in allowable as it as a matter of uh, entertainment so in order to shock this person who was saying something clearly against his own religion, I said, are you telling me that, that sex is like mixed doubles tennis? It's merely a sport that you indulge in that requires two sexes? Now, I thought he was going to go, oh, no, no, I couldn't say that. That's outrageous. That's, that's blasphemy. No, he didn't say that. He said yes. And I was shocked. Yep. And I looked up at the naked heavens and I said, dear empty heavens, holy God in whom I do not believe. I didn't actually say that, but let's just say I did. I said, how in the world could my friend... This is one of my close friends. This guy had been a roommate in college and all sorts of stuff. I mean, very, very tight with me. Uh, uh, well, not a roommate in college, but that, that level of friendship. Who robbed him of romance? Everything from Job and Juno, Minnie and Mickey Mouse, uh, 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 Romeo and Juliet, every love story, every love song, every, every, uh, every marriage ever made, someone has stolen from him. He can't even understand the the the, the glory of the of the male and female uh, uh, mating dance, the wonder and the mystery and the, the heartache and the pain and the loss and the thrills of falling in love and and wooing a woman and and uh, carrying her over the threshold and seeing her dressed as a bride and all that stuff is gone because he doesn't believe in it. He just thinks sex is is mutual masturbation, which is about the most disgusting thing I can think of. I was physically revolted. This is a guy who said he was a Christian. And I said to him, listen, not only does your God say otherwise, but so does Allah and Confucius and the Buddha and the witches of the Norse, because the, the, uh, the, the Viking religion, whom you would think would not say this, says that the, the uh, adulterers are thrown into Nastrond, that they're, they're flaming hell, okay? And the, the Greeks and Romans, the, the Romans would bury a Vestal Virgin who, who betrayed her oath of virginity. Bury her alive. One of the more painful and disgusting deaths that you can imagine. Everyone, everyone knows this is wrong. It's inescapable knowledge. How can you not know it? And I looked up at the blank heavens and I said, who has robbed my friend? 
And my sense of logic, very much against my will and very much against my inclination, said contraception. I said, what? How could contraception be to blame for lowering the moral hazard of the sex act? But, not, but it could not be anything else. It wasn't anything else. So I looked around my mental landscape and I said, who is it that agrees with me that contraception is a grave moral evil? And I should emphasize that I came to this conclusion just from a purely logical standpoint, just as a matter of prudential concern for how to organize your sexual passions so as not to cause the harm of bastardy or creating an orphan, or worse yet, killing a child in the womb, which I always thought was, was, was uh, uh, ever since I had kids, I realized that kids were people, okay? So, the Roman Catholics. I said, are you kidding me? The crazy, insane Christians who believe in Santa Claus who believe this this world, which clearly arose out of nothing for purely by purely natural processes, was a is a created thing. Who who uh, think that they're like, they're, they're godlike in their in their image and likeness? Uh, they're the, the insane people who are responsible for every war that ever ever uh, existed. No, excuse me, I didn't I didn't believe that at the time. I'm, even I was not that stupid. Uh, I said, how can the crazy Christians be, be correct on this point? And worse, the most conservative, the most crazy, the most superstitious Christians at all. How was it possible? So I said, I'm going to have to look into this. There may be something to their worldview. I do like C.S. Lewis and I do like G.K. Chesterton and they talk like reasonable, they talk like sane men and the guys on my side, my people, whose uniform I wear and under whose banners I march are crazy as bedbugs. They're, they're freakingly insane. And this was before the phrase woman's penis was, was coined, was invented. Yeah. Years before, years and years before. Yeah, yeah. So I tried reading... Uh, Thomas Aquinas, thinking that if anyone could convince me, he could. And now I had read him in school, I had read him in college, and I remember thinking at the time that he made a, a, a fundamental error in his reasoning very right at the beginning. When I reread him, that error wasn't there. I realized that I had been in error by making an assumption, a logical assumption I shouldn't make about the nature of uh, cause and effect and the nature of uh, uh, the hierarchy of reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I said, huh, that's funny, huh? I'm a perfectly logical being, but I made a mistake in my logic. Oh, and during my conversation with my Christian friends, one of them said, what could convince you that God was real? If, if an archangel appeared in front of you with a halo and a flaming sword and the book of the law tucked under his arm, surrounded by a host of singing cherubim, would that convince you? And I said, no, it would not. He said, well, why not? I said, well, I know God doesn't exist, so I would assume that anything I saw was hallucination, was a delirium, was a dream. Mm. Now, Convenient. he... Convenient. Now, my sense of logic snuck up on me and said, wait a minute, Mr. Wright. My sense of logic is very formal. It's very polite to me. <laughs> I said, what is it? What is it, sense of logic? It says, you're, that's a circular argument. You're assuming the conclusion you want to prove. I said, no, wait a minute. My, my, uh, my, my logic is completely uh, coherent and uh, there's no, there's no self-contradictions in anything. I've checked every link in my chain of reasoning one link at a time and uh, I start from the assumption there's no God and I come to the conclusion there's no God. Wait a minute, my, I'm, I'm wrong. I, 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 as a perfectly logical being, I've made another mistake. Now, uh, instead of blowing myself to pieces like Nomad uh, on the Star Trek episode where the perfectly logical computer <laughs> realizes it's mistaken, I tried to reprogram myself. I just tried to read Thomas Aquinas. It was too thick. I read the first four pages and it took me a week. And then I looked at the, the, pa the unread pages in my other hand endless endless fields of gray text and i said if there is a god and if he is merciful he does not expect people to read thomas <laughs> aquinas from cover to cover to find out whether he exists or not he would make some easier quicker method of finding out that he existed he'd have some sort of method i'm not even sure what it could be where you would like somehow in, like intuitively know or something like that which, but that's impossible but you know uh, how could that happen so uh it was thanksgiving when all the world was, all, everyone in America was giving, was giving thanks to God. And my wife, who is Christian, and by the way, she prayed for me, and I've had many arguments with her over the years, browbeating her mercilessly, but her, her sense of logic never failed. Her, her worldview was also coherent, and that kind of impressed me, even though I didn't agree with the premises. It's sort of like non-Euclidean geometry. If you don't assume play for his axiom, you still get to conclusions that there's not, there's not, uh, uh. so I said, okay, I can't reason my way out of the circular argument I'm trapped in. 
And I can't think of any way of any evidence that God could give me to prove he exists because I would reject it, you know, because I don't think he's a coherent concept. I don't think, I think he's like A equals not A. I don't think he's logical. Mm -hmm. Or that the concept of God is, is, a, is an understandable concept, understandable human beings. So I said, okay. I looked around. And I said, I had just been to church for like, you know, once a year I go to church to please my wife because I wanted my kids raised to be Christian because my kids were too young to understand that you shouldn't steal because you don't know that a society where stealing is licit. My kids, however, were young enough to understand that there's a big sky father who will punish you if you steal. And I didn't want them to steal. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Very practical for an atheist. So I got down on my knees. I said, dear God, I know you don't exist. I can prove it with the same mathematical certainty as Euclid can prove that uh, the, the, uh, the Pythagorean theorem. But just in case I'm wrong, as a philosopher, I have to admit a matter, as a matter of honor, as a point of honor, I have to admit that it's possible for me to be wrong, as amazing as that seems. It's possible that there's an error in my logic, as unusual as that would be. So there must be some way you can prove that you exist to me and prove it so overwhelmingly that I can't, I won't be able to deny it, that I won't be able to reject it. That was a it. mistake. Oh, I was sticking a fork into a light socket. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I was experimenting, and the, like Frankenstein, the experiment came to life. So I said, either you don't care if I am damned, in which case you are not benevolent, therefore not God, or you lack the power to create evidence for me, in which case you're not omnipotent, therefore not God, or you lack the foresight to see how it could be done, in which case you're not omniscient, in which case not God. And in either case, unworthy of my worship in any case. Thanking you in advance for your cooperation. Uh, and I, so I got up and dusted off my knees and said, honor is satisfied. I have now an empirical proof to show that God does not exist and the prayers go unanswered. Uh -oh. The next day, I had a heart attack, I uh -oh. who had not even been in ill health. I was dying. I was, I was in excruciating pain, writhing on the floor, covered with sweat. And I said to my wife, who's a Christian scientist, they have a healing ministry. I said, either get me to the emergency room or call one of your practitioners. She called a practitioner. The guy prayed and prayed for me. The heart, the heart attack stopped. Like that. The moment he said the prayer. Now, Christian science practitioners make their living, make their money by saying prayers for people and healing them. Their rates of success are slightly better than those of doctors. If you look into it statistically, okay, this is a guy who says, this is a guy, this is like a mechanic who says, I can fix your car for 20 bucks if you let me fix your car. So here's a guy who says, I can cure your sickness by prayer if you'll cooperate, you know, and I can do it. And he did it. So I said to my atheist self, wait a minute, that... That looks a lot, and I was I was not hurt at all. I was the pain was entirely gone. I said that uh, that looks a lot like a miracle, but that can't be a miracle because I know miracles don't exist. That must have been a coincidence. And then I said I'd really like to have more coincidences like that in my life if I could. <laughs> that's, that's kind of you know startling. So I said to the wife, I said let's go to the hospital anyway. I want to find out what had been wrong with me. I thought maybe it was an attack of pleurisy or something. So they go to the hospital and they examine me and they say, you have five clogged arteries in your heart. I said, I didn't even know I had five arteries in the heart. I thought I only had four. And then I said, no, no, you should be dead. There's, there's, we can't explain why you're not dead. I said, okay. <laughs> so, wow. uh, they say, we're going to keep you overnight and we're going we're gonna to cut you open like a, like, a, uh, like a pig in the morning and, and to poke around in your innards. Uh, you know. So I said, fine, sure, that sounds good to me. Uh, so I was sitting there thinking and pondering as to how a miracle could happen in a world where there's no possibility of miracles. And as I was pondering and meditating, and I should say, I was not in any pain at that point. I was not, they did not give me any drugs or anything. I was in clear and in my right mind, in my right wits. Uh, I became aware that I had a soul. I could, I could see it. I could suddenly feel it intuitively, immediately. Not through any sense perception. Your senses can fail you. You can, if you stick a stick in the water, it might look bent, okay? If you hear a noise that's echoing strangely, mm -hmm. you might think it's coming from your left when it's coming from your right. But not something that's inside you that you know by knowledge, by pure, by pure immediate perce perception. So I said, how, how can I have a soul? I'm, a, I'm an atheist. I know souls don't exist. That, that can't be. I, I believe in the truth, but I don't believe in God. And in my mind, I could see the truth turn and look at me and address me like it was a person. The thing I had been serving all my life, the truth, turned out to be alive, okay? That was a little startling to me, Fair uh, to say the least. And the Holy Spirit was poured into my, into my soul like wine into a dirty cup. And I could feel, I feel like a physical sensation that accompanied the spiritual reality. 
and I sudden and it was not like a a uh, God came in front of the jury box of my reason and said, "Here's the evidence that I exist. Here's the evidence that I don't exist." Way in your mind, no, the 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 intuitive knowledge, the perfect knowledge that came suddenly to me, was exactly what I had been praying for and thought could not happen. So That's, the Holy yeah. Spirit came to visit me. Some, then some I had a friends. vision. <laughs> Then the Virgin Mary came to talk to me. She asked me why her son had been killed. She said other things to me that I will not repeat because she asked me not to repeat them to, to uh, uh, other people. Then I saw God, uh, like a light that existed in all places and times and fills all time and space and is, and is infinitely uh, shedding ecstasy and pure pleasure and love and glory in all directions of all the time. Again, not, under, not on drugs, not in any pain, not in... Not in, uh, not in any. Uh, I was in my right wits, in my right mind. I was oriented as to time, place, and person. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. I, I have known people. I, I have a brother-in-law who is afflicted with with hallucinations, who suffers from a, 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 a manic depression. So I know that bizarre things can happen inside someone's head, but they usually have certain symptoms or signs. None of the signs are present in my case. I, I took the time to look into it. Uh so then Christ came to talk to me, and uh, he terrified me beyond the capacity for rational thought. I, 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 I know you Christians love your Christ, but he scares me. Because he looked at me and he said, God judges no man. God will never condemn you. I will be your judge at the end of time. I will judge you. And I said to myself, wait a minute. This has got to be a hallucination or a dream, because there's no way. I know the Christian God is judgmental. He, he flooded the world in the time of Noah. He judges people all the time. This can't be right. After I got out of the hospital, when I was reading the Bible, which I thought I should read, not the Holy Spirit was living inside me, uh, I came across a passage in, in the book of John that said it almost word for word. I think I had one word different from the translation I read. And I said, huh, how in the world did I psychically perceive the writing in a book that I had never read <laughs> and have a hallucination where those words were repeated to me word for word with, with one word wrong? Uh, if this was all that heart attack was triggered by me deliberately trying to make myself believe in God and then I hallucinated all these things but I didn't hallucinate a God I would have liked to serve like Thor because then I could go out and burn things and kill people and do other fun stuff no I, now I'm in this religion where you turn the other cheek are you out of your mind Why, you know someone said to me oh no no your religion is just your uh, it's just you uh, uh, you psychologically it's wish fulfillment I said this Religion does not fulfill any wishes I have ever had. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know, right? I am, I am not a turn the other cheek kind of guy. Okay, I'm sorry. I love pride. I'm proud of being proud. And now I have to be humble, as, as Christ was humble. Hmm. Uh, so, after having a miracle, a miracle cure, the visitation by the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, miracle visitations by the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary... Uh, and not to mention some other things I also saw. About a month later, I had another religious experience where I was taken outside my body and shown the structure of time and space, and the philosophical problem of determinism versus free will was, was, was shown to me. And I saw the mind of God, which was more complicated than anything I could put into words, and more pure and more perfect and more good. And that was weeks after this it, 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 there's even if you thought that maybe i had been exposed to you know gamma radiation while i was in the hospital this is this is weeks and weeks later so an atheist friend of mine once quizzed me about these various events these various religious experiences ecstasies visions miracles and so on and so forth now i'm not even going to bother mentioning all the times prayers since then have been answered and, and sometimes immediately and sometimes outrageously okay mm. uh I got all the evidence I wanted. I, it was poured over my head like a bucket. I should not have asked. It was really a bad idea. <laughs> Any person who was not stupid could have simply looked out the window and seen the organization and the beauty of nature and seen that birds have wings for a purpose and nothing can have a purpose unless there's a mind to give it purpose. Nothing can be deliberate unless there's a deliberator. The bird did not decide that the wing would be the proper organ to let him fly. You know? So, uh, uh, I, I don't feel like I was singled out for any special reason, uh, but it was a road to Damascus moment. It was, it was absolutely 
God decided to pick the guy who hated him the most. I don't even know if I hated him the most. Uh, these, other, these other atheists were a lot worse than I was. It's no merit of mine. It's, it, it's, God works in mysterious ways. I, I, and I'm just yeah. kind of embarrassed that I had to be clocked over the head by a two-by-four before I could see something that was so obvious. You know, that would, had been living inside me the whole time. And uh, once the Holy Spirit is inside you, you're kind of aware of it in the back of your mind, the way you can he- kind of hear mm. a ticking clock in a quiet room. You know? Yep. So that's my conversion story. Maybe a little later in the podcast, I'll tell you why I became a Catholic as opposed to something else. <laughs> yep. No, that's fair. The moral of the story is be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, um, I've, I've heard that sort of story before of I, you know, I ask God, if you're really there, show me you exist. It's like, that is. What's well, worse is, than that? I said, show me you exist in a way that is so clear and so plain that is absolutely undeniable. Yeah. Which he then did, but in a way I can't show anyone else. Well, there you go. But it's. No one I else. Mean, no one else was in the room. No one else saw it. Hmm. But it's he just like made the said, universe. If if the universe is not evidence enough for you, then you know <laughs> what are you going to do? Is, isn't that is, big enough? Yeah. Isn't that obvious enough? It's all around you. Well, so. it's like you said. It's sticking a fork into a live socket. Like it's just it's the oh, so. Stupid. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's profound and it's 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 the right thing to pray. But it's just the dumbest prayer imaginable. Oh, it's oh you're so right. Oh my gosh, it was dumb. <laughs> Boys and girls, don't do what I did at home. Okay, just read G.K. Chesterton. Read. God in the Dock by C.S. Lewis. His arguments are perfectly sound. And you know there's such a thing as good and evil because you act that way every moment of every day of your life. And if it came from society, then we would not have any ability to criticize society. But we do. So we know there's a higher law than the laws Mm. men make. And nature can't make laws. Nature can obey laws, but it can't make them. If there's a moral law, which is higher than human law, then there's a legislator who's not human, who's higher than human. QED. So, the second part of the story is how I went from being a Protestant Christian to being a Catholic Christian. Um, Aha. Uh-huh. Well, it's interesting. You play a part in that story among some other people. Um, so, I, I started podcasting after I'd become a Christian. I'd been a Christian for about seven or eight years at that point, and I started getting started listening to podcasts when they came out and decided I'd try my hand at it and um, ended up starting the sci-fi show and did that for a while. And I, I did an interview with you, which was uh, fascinating. And I, I spent time talking to atheists and Christians and other people uh, in the interview capacity. And then eventually sci-fi, the sci-fi show became Sci-Fi Journal. And I started buying stories from people. And interestingly, so... I, I should back up slightly. Um, early on when I became a Christian, um, I heard all of the usual um, all of the usual stories from that Protestants tell about Catholics, how Catholics aren't really Christians. Um, you know, they're they're heretics, they're they, they preach another gospel of works and they've forsaken Christ and all, all, all the usual stuff. Um, and if I may, and they lock up the Bible, and they cause wars, and yep. they, uh, right, and yeah, they yeah, worship well, Mary. I mean, right. yep, 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 yep. They want to add Mary to the Trinity, um, all, all this sort of stuff. Um, and I, I didn't know any better, and I thought, mm, okay, well, I guess I'll stay away from that. Um, and then, and then I met some Catholics when I started doing. I'd never really met Catholics before. Uh, back at university or anything, but when I started uh, Sci-Fi Journal, um, I discovered you through uh, Vox's blog, and I read some of your writings and quite liked them, and I thought, oh, you'd be interesting to talk to, and then I started buying stories, and you sold me that wonderful story of aliens that come to Earth chasing why their sun exploded, um, because it turned out to be the Star of Beth. I love that story. Um, That's just such a great story but also in the same journal uh, i bought an episode for an uh, episode i bought a story from um an author i didn't know um named josh young uh who we're friends now 
um, a story of, uh, about a story of a Catholic priest talking to a robot uh, and just a conversation between. But I started meeting all of these Catholics. I met Peter Sean Bradley, and who's a lawyer from California, who I bought story from. Um, and just all of these people that were Catholics, um, Daniel Vecchio, I bought an article from, who's a Catholic philosopher, um, who I'm, I'm good friends with now, and I've interviewed in a different capacity. And what happened? All of the, I met all of these different Catholics, and they seemed to be Christians. This was very, I mean, like, this was, like, I mean, you laugh, but I mean, I'd been told these people preach a gospel of works and have forsaken Christ and were basically modern day Pharisees and all of these, like all of these sorts of untruths and they worship Mary and, or they elevate Mary to deity and all this sort of stuff. And yet these people were all, all struck me as faithful Orthodox Christians. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't off the reservation at all. They were very, oh, and I also encountered the writings of Peter Kreeft um the I, I i i i love peter kreef's writings um i they were profoundly influential and he is a deeply deeply ecumenical man so i moved from well the catholic church is clearly a false a false christianity that's departed from the truth to after meeting a whole bunch of catholics and reading some of their writings and discovering thomas aquinas and just being blown away by um saint thomas who I would never would have called St. Thomas at the time. That's silly, I don't do that. Uh, um, and, and he definitely would have gone along with the reformers. Um, it sounds like what I, happened to me with my atheist friend. I, I, moved, I moved to a different position, I guess, where I had to say, well, Catholics can be Christians too. And that was, that was, that was a bit of a struggle because, of course, it started out with well, some of these Catholics are obviously Christians, but obviously most of them aren't. They're just, they're, they're you know, church and Easter types. We don't like them among us Protestant, us conservative Protestants. Um, but it kept, it kept creeping up on me. Um, and then, and then I watched the Protestant churches go insane. Um, well, the Protestant churches were just getting worse and worse and they were becoming they were embracing um well they were embracing all sorts of evil um and i mean like i know conservative protestants will say they've become apostates and i was like that's fine that's true but they all seem to be doing it and they all seem to be moving in this direction what is pushing them away uh, and you yeah you you actually made an influential comment which i think you made earlier but um that struck me at the time was I looked around at all of the different churches and the Catholics were the same ones. <laughs> like, you know, they were the, they, 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 they were pro-life and they were anti-contraception and all of this sort of stuff. And I was like, hmm, that's a good point. So I bimbled along and I tried to, I, I moved, I moved away from um, Sydney. I moved further out and had to find a good uh, church. <coughs> keep in mind, if you said about it, he's going to hear you. Tried a Baptist he's church, a Brethren it. church, and the Anglican good. church is up here, good but the Anglican church is up here are either. The good Anglican church was a long way away, and the, the local Anglican church... The Anglican church is within a longish walk from my house. Right. Is... Let's just say the minister regularly makes it into the paper for touting every left-wing evil you could imagine. Um... By all accounts, he's a nice guy, but he, there, there is no left-wing evil he will not promote. Um, I don't care. That's fair. Uh, I'm happy to say it about him. I, I think the guy. I think the guy's an apostate, but uh, apparently he's a nice guy. Some people. I've never met him, but I, I wouldn't darken his church door. Um, anyway. Um, so I started flitting from church to church um, in my area and didn't go to church for a few years. And I, I kept reading my Bible and I kept praying, but I was I was trying to find a church Sorry, and that none of them were really fitting. Um, one of them just, just wasn't a good fit. I mean, there was nothing wrong with the church. I think it's a, I think the members there were faithful. It just, just didn't fit at all what I was looking for. I tied the local Baptist church and that seemed a bit wonky and... 
I eventually I eventually went to one of the local Presbyterian churches mm. and that was all right for a while. And then finally, the, one of the ministers there started... Well, actually, I should back up slightly. My first wife passed away um, rather suddenly. Uh, that's okay. It was five years ago now. Um, thank you. Sorry. Um, and that's... That was that was a rough time for a lot yeah. of reasons that I won't go into, um, and and my church at the time was was very helpful and very good and we did a service and buried her and everything. I mean, it was like I, I can't fault them. Um, then I met my current wife. Going to work. I'd looked around at a bunch of the other churches in the area, and they'd already been unsuitable for various reasons. And I thought, well, I've met all these Catholics over the years, and they they seem pretty good. All right. And I talked to Peter, um, my lawyer friend in California, and asked, and I talked to you as well briefly. And I was like, so what's involved in joining the Catholic Church? Um, because I just assumed, because every Protestant church I've, I've been to, basically, you turn up and as long as you go regularly, that makes you a member. I mean, like, there's no, there's no formal initiation or membership requirements. You basically just turn up. Um, and so I discovered it wasn't quite that simple with the Catholic Church, but it, so I reached out to St. Patrick's, my local church, and uh, Chris got in contact with me from the church and said, oh, we've got the, what is it, the RCIA? Um, yes, right. I, I forget what that's called. Uh, the the right it's of a lot, Christian it's a initiation lot, of a, adults. I think of adults, was. Right, um, right. So that's fine. So, okay, so I do this course, and then I go through. So I started attending the church. I started going to Mass once a week. Um, and at first, I didn't take communion. I, I, you know, you're not allowed to take communion. If not allowed. Right. Um, but I, so I'd sit up the back and I'd listen and I'd kneel and I'd, I was... Um, actually, the first week I walked into the church, they had a large picture someone had, in the congregation had painted, not, not, in the, not in the sanctuary at the back, but down off the front as decoration of Mary. So here I was, a lifelong Protestant, finally going to a Catholic church and walked in and there was a big picture of Mary right in the middle of the church in front of the altar. I was like, what the, oh my goodness. It's everything I was told was true. What a, no, that's all, no, hang on, that's probably not it. Um, and I actually, I asked Father Greg about it because um, he would come along to some of the RCIA course things and I went, oh, when I first walked in, it was like this, as he was, it was shocking and I wasn't sure what to make of it. And he laughed and he said, oh, no, it was just decoration. Um, you know, like, yeah, it would never be allowed. It would never be allowed in the in the holy area. It was just decoration at the front. And he thought it was hilarious that I um, had been so taken aback by this. It was fine. It was, um, but I was like, I was just swayed. Like that sort of made me go, okay, so this isn't what I thought it was. I, I'd also learned earlier from learning about the Orthodox Church that icons, icons invent like icons and veneration are not worship and is not idolatry. That These are very distinct things. Um, they could become that, I suppose, if you were doing it wrong, but it's definitely not idolatry. It's definitely not... Veneration is not worship and a statue or a painting is not idolatry um, because none of them... You're not, you're not representing God, um, except in the case of Jesus, but you're only representing Jesus in his physical form. I think that's reasonable. Um, but anyway, I went along to the church. I did the course... Um, three Easter's back, I had my first communion, um, and I've, the, the Catholic Church has been amazing, like, um, this will sound, this will sound, this will upset any Protestants we have listening, because they've got other Protestants I've told it to get very upset, but, um, and it, I, I, it's fine, it's probably, it's, it can just be my experience, but, the Catholic Church is so much like it. There's a the de the depth of what's going on. It's it's so much deeper. Like it's an ocean compared to a thimble or compared to a bathtub um, of what being a Christian is and what worship is like. Um, and I, I, upon reflection, I think I would attribute a good chunk of that to um, Catholic Mass revolves around the Eucharist. Um, yes. and, and Protestant churches revolve around singing the, and the sermon. The sermon. Um, yeah. And that's, 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 I mean, that's fine. They're different. But, mm -hmm. um, but the Catholic Church is, every, every week, the Catholic Church revolves around a miracle of Christ coming to be with us and us 
uh, eating his flesh and, and drinking his blood and communing with God in that way, as well as some singing in a sermon. <laughs> Um, and it's so it's profound just in a way um, I, I don't know I know ne I've never had an experience like that in a Catholic, in a Protestant church they're, they're just it's it's it was it was I, I had profound experiences and I had like I, I came to Christ in the Anglican Church but just yeah it's, it's a bathtub to an ocean and I, I feel bad saying it because it sounds like I'm sort of yeah. crapping on Protestant Christianity and saying it's all garbage. We, but we don't want to. Not, we don't have to offend our. It's we don't not, want to offend our fellow brothers in Christ. But I have to agree. That no, was one of the things that that also is part of my story. Is I thought that the the Protestants I knew were serving me thin soup. Yeah, it just wasn't enough. It was it was right, but it wasn't. It was part of the story, but it wasn't the whole story. Yeah, it's just and. And also, like, I mean, it blows me away. All of the, um, everything in the Catholic Church just about has meaning and significance and the way things are done are all, like, the Mass is done the way it's done. And e everything in it is purposeful. It's done that way, by the way, because of the book of the Apocalypse. What St. John saw them doing in heaven is what we're trying to mimic here on Earth. Okay. Did, I mean, did just, not... if, that, if that doesn't blow your mind, just think <laughs> about that for a minute. No, it does, but um, but it's just but all of it is significant, in a way that right. I, I've never I never I was I was certainly never taught that in twenty years in Protestant churches, right? Um, but yeah, all of the mass is is significant, and all of it is all of it goes in a certain direction, and yeah, it's just so, and it's also it's 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 very Catholic churches are beautiful, like. Um, even even your local, not very not like you don't have to go to the basilicas or um, you know things like that to see a beautiful Catholic church. Even even the sort of mundane, run of the mill Catholic churches have a have a beauty and uh, reverence to them that I I apologize to the Protestants listening, but the Protestant church in a school gym does not have. The beauty and the majesty of a Catholic church. I mean, it can't. And the that's Protestant where... Protestant churches sometimes have the sanctity and the holiness of simplicity, of, of getting away that's from true. all decoration. That's and true. one of the most holy places I've ever been in was the Lutheran church in my grandfather's uh, village. But having said that, uh, the one reason why I became a Catholic, one of the many reasons which I'll be happy to go into, is mm -hmm. there was nothing in the Protestant uh, discipline that some Catholic order didn't also do. If you want severity and simplicity like a Puritan, there are Benedictines and Jesuits that will that live that way already. Mm. But if you want if you want statues and, and festivals and, and Easter feasts, there are there are Catholics that have that have that as well. You know, if you want music and, and so on, mm. we also oh. have that. So with with the Catholics, I just felt I got everything. Let me well, let me tell, let me briefly tell you my. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Let me let me finish on. The other thing is, like, as I was saying, Catholic theology is, is so deep. I mean, th there's, no, there's, no, there's no hint of a works-based salvation in it at all um, that I've encountered. What, what that phrase no, mean? I don't know what oh, that means. Oh, so, so you can earn your way to heaven? There's no aspect of that in Catholic teaching. But I can see no. why some Protestants are confused, um, not least because... Protestants and Catholics use the word sanctifi sanctification and justification in opposite ways. Um, you are you you are sanctified when you come to Christ, and then your justification is working that out and becoming a little Christ in the Catholic Church. But Protestants talk about becoming justified and then becoming sanctified, or you are justified and then you become sanctified instead of becoming sanctified and then being justified. And as a result. Um, if they use the terms the same way, each would be right to point to the other and go heretic, but they don't. It's very frustrating. But uh, I hope your frustration is soothed somewhat because I've heard that in recent years, public documents exchanged between the leaders of, of several churches have, have basically Good. agreed that their differences are terminological and not, not fundamental. Good. Because, well, Which okay. We need, to, we need to communicate this to more Protestants. But it's also things in the Catholic Church like um, the right of reconciliation or confession is it's amazing 
May I say a word about that before I tell you my story? Sure. Well, well I'm, 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 I'm happy to wrap my story up there. I have moved to okay. the Catholic Church, and I, I feel like I have come home. And <laughs> I am swimming in an ocean I could drown in easily because of its depth. It's amazing. And I would, I would, invite, I would invite all of our Protestant listeners to find some Catholics, talk to them, find, find faithful ones. Don't, don't find the church and Easter types. Um, and try it, you'll like it, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, explore it and don't, don't be hostile towards it because you'll learn a lot, if nothing else. Anyway, you were going to say? I, I love confession. Let confession me, is let me, uh, difficult, but wonderful. Let me tell you my <laughs> confession story last. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say my my. Uh, sure, please. Tell us how you ended up first. in the Catholic Church. So... After I converted to Christianity, because I had been converted by the prayers of my wife and, and, and her Christian science uh, uh, practitioner, uh, you would think that I would want to be a Christian scientist because that's, I actually firmly believe that if you can possibly avoid it, you should not have a mixed marriage. The parents should be of the same denomination and raise the kids in the same way. Otherwise, the children are going to be confused and they, and they, they ought not to be about something so fundamental and so, and so important. Mm. So I really wanted to join her church. But I, something kept holding me back. And I, I have to confess that I was quite angry when I first was converted to Christianity. Because it was like being an orphan. I, I was like an orphan on death row. I thought I was going to die. I thought I, was, I thought I was a mortal being. And I found out I was not. I found out I was immortal, like all people are. And so I break out of the prison yard. And, and I, I'm free on the street. And a voice says, your parents are alive. And I go, yay, I'm not an orphan. There's, I'm not alone in this universe. Where are my parents? And then a voice says, they're divorced. You have to decide which one to cleave to so you can spurn the other one because the Christians who all believe in the God of love quarreled and cannot get along. They decided it was better to split the church in half than to try to try to be together in love and uh, despite their mm. differences. I said, are you kidding me, Christians? Why did you do such a stupid thing? So I was mad at the Christians, but I said, okay, I've got to decide where to go. And... Uh, because I had, if you remember my first part of my story, I had already come to the conclusion that divorce was impermissible. It was not logical. You can't give your word that you're going to love someone forever and then go back on that. Okay? Mm -hmm. The mere possibility that you can do that for any reason other than uh, uh, fornication introduces an element of uncertainty that is, un that is un uh, uh, impermissible for raising children. Okay? It's just a fact. So I said, okay, uh, the Anglicans are out. Any church that permits divorce, I can't, I cannot believe, uh, is 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 truly following Christ. And here's why: I read the Bible, first time in my life, atheist life. Your Christ speaks in riddles and parables, and he's not clear, except in one passage. There's only one thing he says that is completely unambiguous, even in translation, that cannot be mistaken, which is that if you Put away your wife, you divorce your wife, and she marries someone else, she's an adulteress. I said, okay, that's that's absolutely clear. That's written there in black and white. And when Christ said it, also in red. So I couldn't, uh, it wasn't even in the running for me to to look at any church that followed the Anglican heresy. Okay? And not because I believed one church or the other. In fact, I was sort of, didn't want to go to the Catholics because I thought they were crazy. Mm. You know, I thought they were too much. Also, contraception. I had, for independent reasons, based purely on logic, having nothing to do with any religious doctrine, believed that the introduction of contraception in society was detrimental to women, detrimental to the family, detrimental to marriage, and disordered one's natural sexual appetites. Yep. Okay? So I said, okay, anyone who's not anti-divorce and anti-contraception is not even in the running for me. So there were very few people left. And at the time, I thought the Greek Orthodox Church was still in the running. I have since found out that they do permit divorce, and so I'm a little sorry that I gave them the benefit of the doubt. Now, I also knew that I was not smart enough of a theologian to go through all the theological disputes that had d divided these denominations, and I certainly did not know what the difference was between a uh, Reformed Baptist and a pre-Reformed Baptist and a post-unreformed left-wing whatever, you know, uh, Wesleyan or something, something. So I said, okay, let's, let's approach this in kind of a, a lawyerly way, because I'm a lawyer. There's a message from Christ. He gave it to some messengers known as the apostles. The message has been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, 
some people say the message was corrupt and that the real message is something else, okay? The guys who say the message is corrupt date from either the 1600s or mm -hmm. the 1900s. But the guys who say that Christ is the, is the head of their church date from 50 AD, okay? Date from the first century. So what are the odds that the guys who are... So either the message of Christ was been carried down through time faithfully or not faithfully. If it was carried faithfully, the people who are carrying it would have the same doctrines they have now as they had then. Hmm. Okay? The guys who are being unfaithful, who are claiming the first guys messed up the message. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's like a king in a distant country. He had, it sends a message from some messengers, and by the time the three messengers get to you, they each accuse the other one of having messed up the message. So you have to decide based on the message who's, who's telling the truth. Uh, and I realized, well, I can't I can't join any church that is not being guided by the Holy Spirit, and I don't think any church that allows for divorce or homosexuality or priestesses or anything else. Those are clearly human innovations because no Protestant church agreed that contraception was licit until 1930. And we're mm -hmm. talking about a religion that's 2,000 years old, or if the Christian claim that, we're, that we are part of the Jewish heritage is correct, it's as old as time. It's as old as the Bronze Age. Okay? So then I... I looked at the idea of what was or what was not canonical in the Bible. Because one of the groups said that the canon of the Bible is, is all you need to do to be Christian. But they also had removed books from the Bible. Okay, mm -hmm. But the canon of the Bible is from the 5th century. And the books they removed, and, and some of the doctrines they accepted, like the Nicene Creed, is older than that. Mm. Reverence to Mary is older than the canon of the Bible. 250 AD is the oldest known prayer to Mary. Okay. So, uh, and the, nowhere in the Bible or in the traditions of the church or anywhere else does any Christian say that if your bishop is bad, you have the right to start your own church. Christ did not give, Christ did not grant the apostles the power to start churches of their own when they quarreled with each other. That's not a Christian notion. That's a American Revolution notion. That's the notion that if the king betrays the, uh, the law of God, then you can overthrow the king and set up a republic. You have that right from God. But God didn't say you have the right, if you're disagreeing mm -hmm. with my ministers I placed over you, to overthrow them and worship me in some fashion that you find nice, based on your own human wisdom. Okay? And then I said, well, wait a minute. Did, did Martin Luther actually perform miracles? Did he cure the sick? Did he raise the dead? Because the leader of the Catholic Church did, as did his apostles. Mm. And I said, well, no, he was, he, was a, he was a Catholic himself, and he had certain theological problems with, the, with, the, uh, with his leadership. So then I look into the, uh, the idea that you could learn Christianity just from the Bible without, without the surrounding tradition. That, even before I was a Christian, even when I was an atheist, I thought that was illogical. Only the tradition tells you the Bible is holy. Okay. It doesn't have any authority on its own. It's just not a book. It's not a book that fell out of the sky. It was a book mm. that was written by a group of people, and that group of people must have the divine mandate. Otherwise, the Bible can't have the divine mandate. Yep. And certainly, nobody in the 16th century has the right to throw pieces out of the Bible and throw them away. Now, when I talked to my Protestant friends about this, they said, "Oh no, no, we didn't throw those books away. They they never were in there to begin with." And I just and I just I'm sorry. That's just not historically accurate. That's not. Mm. That's just a, that's just a falsehood. Yep. Well, then I ran into something very odd indeed. I Back when I was an atheist, I said a lot of things about the Christians that were just not true. I asserted Christians believed things they didn't believe or, or said things they didn't say, hadn't said. Mm. I asserted they started wars they hadn't started, for example. But now that I was a Christian, I began to see the atheists doing the same thing to the... I began to see the Protestants doing the same thing to the Catholics that the atheists did to the Protestants. And it was the same arguments offered in the same way. It's a shocking now, realization, isn't it? This could be just the Catholics I met and just the Protestants I met. It it's may not. just be a coincidence. In my case, it may just be a coincidence that the Protestants I met were, were, were not well learned in the, in the history and that the Catholics were. But no Catholic I met was unaware of what the doctrine of justification by works alone was or the doctrine of sola scriptura was. None of them said that the Protestants were teaching a doctrine the Protestants don't teach, okay? Mm -hmm. But all of the Protestants said the Catholics teach doctrines or had habits or had behaviors or had disciplines that they did not have. 
Yeah. Now, usually there, there were some subtle differences. We do revere Mary, we Catholics. You know. Now, here's the other factor. My, my approach was very different from yours because I was an atheist. To me, uh, if you're outside the entire solar system and you're approaching the sun, Pluto is, is just as close as Earth is to you because you're coming toward all the planets together. Okay? Only after you pass Mars is Pluto to one side of you and Earth to the other side. <laughs> well, so only yeah. once I became a Christian did I have to decide what the difference was between the Christians. Because the differences, I hate to say it, are minor. And I honestly believe heaven would prefer us not to quarrel. Okay. I, I actually I push back against that. I don't think the difference between Protestants is minor at all. Compared it's to not... atheism? Oh, yes, compared to atheism, yes. Right. It's, rel it's relatively minor. Do you but... believe in one God? Do you believe in one God? Both of them. Sure, but... The okay, that cuts out that cuts out 90% of the differences between Christianity and the religion. But Do you believe almost... he's the creator of heaven and earth? So, no, yes. I'm not going to even gonna let you push back on this. It's, it's, on, you're not an on. atheist. You don't hang know. On. No, 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 wait, wait. But I would note, um, you, you could say the same thing about Islam and Christianity versus atheism. Like... Islam it's, is closer to Christianity than atheism the, is. Islam is a heresy. It's very close. Of course. They, no, no, they I know, adopt like, it all. So yes, they are close. But it's it's more... Compared, compared to atheism? Yes, absolutely they are. But but Hinduism is closer to Christianity than atheism is to Christianity. Like, I mean, yes. A, like yes. Atheism, atheism is just a different universe. <laughs> I was coming from the moon. And, and from the moon... The Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere are in the same spot, as is North and South America. I, I agree. No, no, as I understand, is New York I understand and Connecticut. what you're saying. I understand That's what all you're I meant. That's Sorry, all I my meant. apologies. So you, so you can't push back on that. <laughs> compared to compared to from my point of view, yeah, where I was enough. coming from, you guys are you guys are Siamese twins, okay? That's fair. But there was a difference, and thanks to your quarreling with each other, I had to make a decision. Okay, <laughs> as to where to go to pray. Now my wife was very understanding about this, and I do not understand why she was understanding about this, because her church healed me, performed a miracle. Okay, mm. uh, I I had even I had adopt I had let her use the Christian Science methods to to pray for our children and heal our children when they were sick, and it worked more often than taking them to a doctor did. I had no doubts about their doctrines, about their excuse me about their practices. I just I just thought it was thin soup i thought there was there was too much of the founder of the religion and not enough about christ even though they talk about christ as much as any christians do and the same thing was true of my lutheranism from my childhood in the lutheran church they talked about lutheran more often than than they should because he's their founder okay and so on for all my other protestant uh, friends and brethren they 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 didn't have christ as the soul and summit uh, as the head of their church and some of them, and I hate to say this, some of them seemed to me like they were spiritually dead, like the, like the Holy Ghost was not in their church. Now, the Catholics, on the other hand, who, I have to say, looked like a, a terrible and corrupt organization that <laughs> done a lot of bad things in history, and yeah, including, you know, diddling with children and other things that are just outrageous, mm. not even when the, the Pope was a Borgia Pope, and who had a mistress, did he say, oh, and by the way, God says it's okay to do this. They never changed their doctrine. They don't have the authority to change their doctrine, okay? Mm. They also didn't lock, lock, lock up their books in the Middle Ages to prevent the, uh, to prevent the uh, uh, parishioners from reading them. That was a lie, okay? They also did print Bibles in the vernacular before the Protestant Reformation. That's also a lie. They also didn't uh, uh, say that you could get into heaven by paying money. That's also a lie. Yep. Okay? And on and on and on. And, all, and I think, okay, you don't, shoot, you don't shoot blanks if you have ammo. If, the, if my Protestant brothers had a good reason to say that, that, that Catholicism is, was wicked or wrong, they would tell me what it is. Now, as an atheist, as an ex-atheist, I had no problem. I, To this day, I do not understand the enmity toward Mary. She's the mother of Christ, okay? She was a... a, a, she was a I met her. She She's a perfect woman. I'll, I'll do anything to see her again. I'll do anything I have to do to get into heaven so I can talk to her again. There's, there's, there's no way that a Christian should... Just, utter any word of enmity toward that woman okay mm -hmm. and to say oh well you uh if you show her respect you're taking respect away from god i go the only reason why i respect her is because of god <laughs> are you out of your mind are you, is that that's like saying i can't love my wife unless i also love god uh, I, I i will pick god over my wife if the two ever come in conflict but it's mm -hmm. that's insane okay so i've never understood it it seems to me like it's a psychopathology 
that comes out of the German mind that Luther had some psychological problems. And I apologize to my Lutheran brethren, but I did used to be Lutheran. Luther liked, actually, Luther um, liked Mary. I think it's come from Calvin, but um, anyway. I, I apologize to Luther then. I, I should not be so so uh, uh, venomous with my tongue about he, my fellow, he, he, my he fellow happy, brother in Christ. He was happy I hope, to call her the mother of God and... That's I hope thing. it's it's a I Calvin. Hope, it's it's more of a Calvin thing, I think. I hope to embrace him in heaven as we sit down to the feast of the Lamb, when all these divisions will be forgotten. Okay, mm, agreed. But I still had to pick a church to go to. So <laughs> one of the things I did is I went through a history of the heresies of the first through tenth centuries, mm -hmm. and they all sounded like the same kind of thing that modern heretics say. It, it just looked to me like. The, the idea of a heresy is an idea where you take an organic body of knowledge and lore, a, a, an organic tradition, and you say, this part is paramount, and the other parts are of lesser importance or no importance. Okay? Yeah. And that looked to me like what the people who broke away from the Catholic Church were doing. Now, I will not say that about the break between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, the East and Western Churches. That was different, Because yeah. that, to me, looks like it was, it was mostly political, and very little yeah. of it was doctrinal. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree. Now, I also had a, a rather bizarre approach. I was not picking a church based on what would make me feel good or what would be nice for my family. If I had been concerned with my family, I would have gone to my mother, my wife's church, and, and they would have kept everything in the family, you know. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't. I couldn't because it wasn't enough. Uh, it wasn't the whole... It, it didn't give me the entire Western world for 2,000 years. It gave me... I mean, imagine if you became a Mormon. Mormons are all the Mormons I meet are nice guys. All the yep. Mormons I meet are good, sound, moral people who believe in God. Mm -hmm. But if I, you were Mormon, you could only read books that were 100 years old or less. Because that's, that's where the Book of Mormon comes from. You don't, have, you don't have the tradition. You don't have the richness. You don't, and you're not where it comes from. It comes from somewhere else. Now, this happened to me when I was talking to a Mormon. He said that Jesus Christ was, was a Christian, as were the apostles. But with, when, when John was assumed into heaven, when John died in about the year A.D. 100, there were no Christians on earth until Joseph Smith. None of them go to heaven. None of their sacraments are valid. None of the things they taught were, 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 uh, were correct teachings. So all of history is blank. And God was just waiting for Joseph Smith. Now, of course, God works in mysterious ways. That could have been the case. But where did Joseph Smith get his ideas from? Well, he got them from the church as, as did all of the protestant reformers they got their ideas from the church that they were trying to reform because they said it had grown, grown corrupt hmm. but no protestant i ever spoke to could tell me when the church got corrupt and none of them picked a date uh after before the bible was was canonically decided i because they all agreed on the bible yeah i found the same thing i i um but that date the, 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 there were already bishops by the first century so you can't get rid of bishops you know, there was oh. already there was already the sacraments by the by the first and second century, so you can't get rid of that stuff either. There was already apostolic succession, so you can't start a church without apostolic succession. At least the Greek Orthodox have that; they can say generation by generation where their doctrine comes from. Oh, I I got See? into an argument with a friend of mine because he was insisting the Catholic Church was all right when it produced the Bible to some degree, although he backpedaled on that when I went. Well, yeah, but you. You get very upset at the Hail Mary, the first prayers to Mary are for 250 AD. So when does this corruption set in? Because those prayers predate the doctrine of, well, the, the ratification right. of the doctrine of the Trinity at Nicaea. Right. So. Now, I will say you know. that Mormons are a little better off because Mormons are not Trinitarians. But any Trinitarian, if you accept the, 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 the findings of the Nicene Council, you have to tell me the reason why you reject the findings of the, of the Council of Trieste. You know, or the Council of Trent, or the Council, of, or the other councils. Well, okay. they were later. They were later. I mean, and none. Of, oh, yeah, they were later. Okay, fine. Well, that's, that, not, that a, that's not. That's not. That's not a legally legitimate argument. That would be the argument, though. It's the not legally corrupt, legitimate. The church was corrupt by then. I've had this conversation. <laughs> that is the. That is the answer you'll get. But but it's not a legally legitimate argument. It, it, it still doesn't. It still doesn't detract from the authority that you're that you. You're still sawing off the branch you're sitting on. You have to rest well, on the authority of the church in order to reform the church. Yeah. What? Why is one authoritative and the other? You seem very. Ha they seem very happy to pick and choose what they regard as authoritative. Right. It now, seems. It seems to be the authority is 
this is probably too harsh, but it seems the authority is, they are the authority deciding what counts right. and what doesn't. Now, once you say that the King of England is the Pope and gets to decide doctrinal matters for all the churchgoers in his land, or you say you are the Pope and you get to decide doctrinal matters, you're claiming something the Pope doesn't claim. Because the mm. Pope doesn't say he decides doctrinal matters. He says he passes them along. Mm. Okay? He just says he's, he's carrying a message, not that he's making stuff up. At most, they can say, the Catholics say that as the, as the doctrines uh, organically grow, they have to clarify certain things that otherwise are puzzlements, like the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of the Incarnation. Mm -hmm. Now, so, but my approach was an almost entirely intellectual because uh, as a lawyer, I wanted to be in a church that taught the right thing, even if the church itself, I mean, Joe Biden's a Catholic and so is Nancy Pelosi. And these are, these are wicked, wicked people. Okay, there's no question. And there's certain of the popes in the Middle Ages were wicked men. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Now, I, I'm not that, I'm not that good. <laughs> I mean, Joe Biden has believed in Christ his whole life and I only believed recently, so he might be in heaven higher than me. As startling as that sounds to say, because if he gets on his knees and, and begs repentance for killing babies, you know, if he, if he turns his back on wokeness, he, he could be saved. Of course. He, 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 uh, he, he puts, uh, he, he puts ashes on his head on Ash Wednesday. He knows how to be humble. So, I mean, keep in mind, this is a guy, a political guy, I, I disagree with as vehemently as he possibly can. I mean, I regard him as, as some, as, as, as comically wicked, but compared to me as an atheist, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge. I judge no man. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I judge no man. But I had to pick a church based on what was intellectually satisfying to my sense of right and wrong. And it looked to me like the newer churches couldn't claim that they had authority independent of the older churches. Because if they did claim that every individual, just acting on his own authority, gets to decide the, the, the substance and the net matter of Christian doctrine, then all that will happen is you will get churches that will subdivide and subdivide again which is, in fact, what happened. Mm. Now, if those subdivided churches were all vehemently loyal to the core teachings of the Christian faith, I would cast no doubts on them, and I would say no negative word about them. But they don't, so I can't go there. Okay, They don't, they don't preach against divorce. They don't preach against contraception. They don't preach against abortion. Some do, but some of them have homosexual priestesses and claim to be Christian. Mm. Okay, So there's one church no matter how corrupt or wicked it was, that never changed its, its stance. And it claims that it is guided by the Holy Spirit, not that it's guided by the prayers of its founder. Okay, The Catholic Church makes a different claim about itself than any other church except perhaps the Greek Orthodox. So what happened was my wife, who was much more generous to me than she should be, instead of insisting that I keep faith with the family and, and join her denomination, said, Everyone on your blog is Catholic. All these people who talk to you are, are Catholic. All the people you agree with are Catholic. You think like them, you know? Mm. And maybe you're just not advanced enough to be a Christian scientist. Yes, you, 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 poor, you poor pathetic. Uh, she didn't actually say it, but she should have. So I went to RCIA, and I became great friends with the, with the father there because he was funny and witty and wise. And, mm. uh, and I found out that everything I had been told about the Catholic Church was, was a distortion. I know, okay. right? And I went to my first confession. Now, I had, I had been baptized as a child, as, as Lutheran, so I did not need to be re-baptized or anything. No, neither did I. Yep. When I went to my first confession, I poured out 40 years of filth and blasphemy and sin and lust and pride and everything else. The father said, say, uh, say three Hail Marys. I said, wait, there's no, there's, no, there's no whipping involved? There's no being bound in chains until they <laughs> fall off by themselves? He said... A little leaven will lift the whole loaf. And I thought, and I should say when he said the words, when he said the actual words calling down the power of Christ, and for those of you who are Protestants, no priest claims to the, have the ability to forgive sins. It's, a, it's no. a power that they get in the person of Christ acting in his stead because he asked them to do that for him in his mm -hmm. name. Okay, And nothing prevents you from getting on your knees and praying to God and asking for forgiveness themselves. There's nothing, there's nothing in our sacraments that you have to do that you can't that, that that takes away from any other form of worship. Okay, we have everything you have and more. You've given stuff up that you should not have given up. That helps you. That's an aid to your prayer life. That's an aid to your spiritual life. That's an aid to your growth. That helps you see God. That helps you 
had to take God inside your body so that you'd go inside his body. I felt it when I got forgiven. I, I, I felt that same sensation I had when the Holy Spirit first entered me. Okay? It was undeniable. It was, it was absolutely pure. And for at least, you know, an hour, I was free from sin. I, that was, it was like having your, your, your clothes washed whiter than any fuller on earth can wash them. Mm-hmm. And it was supernatural. And these supernatural events happen to me all the time when I, when I go to Catholic Church. Okay, there's a miracle once a week. Yep. So, so good golly, Miss Molly, if they're not the church, the chances that Joseph Smith could be right, I just don't think is, I'm not willing to, 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 to bet on it. But if I'm wrong, once we get to heaven, I will embrace everyone I have doubted as a brother, and I will say, I was wrong. But I was I was uh, wrong sincerely, and I was not I was not doing it out of pride or uh, mm-hmm. anything else. I, I thought that this was the church. Now I have to admit that the Greek Orthodox have a very good claim to being the original church too. They have the same pedigree. Oh, but sorry. I am a man of the West, and I wanted to be a member of the same church as Robin Hood and King Fair Arthur, and enough. and the people who fought at Lepanto, and the Crusaders in the Middle Ages, and all the other Western traditional figures. That that was then. Our King Arthur was a Catholic. Yep. Okay. So I'd rather be with them than than anywhere else. No, I understand. Sorry, I was just going to say you keep saying Greek Orthodox, but I think you just mean generally Eastern Orthodox. The Greek Orthodox is one one of the churches that's passed part of the Eastern Orthodox churches. There are a variety of Eastern churches, and there's at least there's at least ten of them, and I was not yeah. going to recite, recite all of them. No, I but just the Greek would have said Orthodox. Centered, the Greek Orthodox, however, is centered at Byzantium. Fair so enough. their claim, I think, is better than the, than the Russian Orthodox to be uh, clearly part of the of the uh, heraldry of the original uh, founding apostles. My understanding is all of the Eastern Eastern Orthodox churches are in communion, so they they would they okay. wouldn't they wouldn't. Um, they wouldn't regard themselves as different branches of Christianity. They're all Orthodox churches. It's it's uh, my, I, my, under, my my understanding will... is that would be like there's there's um, there's an Anglican church in Gosford and there's an Anglican church in um, Strathfield and but these are all Anglican churches. It's just they're in different locales. So that is my understanding. I could be mistaken. Go on. I, I will accept the correction with humility. The reason why I was saying Greek Orthodox rather than just Orthodox is because my church is also Orthodox, and their churches are also Catholic, which just is a word that means universal. Yeah, okay, I agree. So I agree. No, I, agree. I was only I was only to be unambiguous. That's but right. I, I honestly didn't look into the other Orthodox churches when I was looking around. I was talking about what I who I was looking at. No, it's it's all good, know? but someone will comment to that effect. So <laughs> that was all. Um, okay, they'll, they'll they'll be right, but it will be a trivial point. That's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Um, actually, I was amused. You, you've mentioned just at the end, um, you, you see miracles all the time in the Catholic Church. Um, a Protestant friend asked me, um, which I thought I'm was... Sl- hel- I'm being slightly sly. I consider the Eucharist to be a miracle because the bread turns into, into it is. the flesh of Christ. Well, no, that's what I said. But she asked, um, is the Catholic Church cessationist? Like, have the miracles ended with the time of the apostles and things like that, um, with exceptions? And I thought I thought about it, and I thought, no, the Catholic Church is the least cessationist church on the planet. We right. have miracles every day of the week in every church, in every Catholic church in the world. Every let me time just mass, say, every time mass is celebrated, that's a miracle. Let me just say that you can go to Lourdes and pray for healing, and you'll be healed. You can go to Mexico and look at the tilde of uh, Juan Valdez, whatever his name was. That has an image of Our Lady on it. You and scientists have studied it, and they cannot explain it. You can go look at the Shroud of Turin. Okay, scientists have looked at it; they can't explain it. Okay. In fact, the one time that the scientists said, "Oh, the Shroud of Turin is fake. We've radiocarbon dated a small a small corner, and it only dates from the 15th century." It turns out that there was a corner that was broken and repaired, and the seamstresses in the 15th century were so cunning in their needlework that modern scientists couldn't see it. Okay. <laughs> Now that if that's not a miracle, don't tell me what is. Uh, there was a Marian apparition uh, 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 earlier this year in in uh, was it Egypt? I don't know. It happens all the time. The the dancing no, sun a, at Fatima. Yeah, it's it's okay? just a ama- it's it's a ama- like yeah like the Catholic Church is the least cessationist church on the planet. Bar none. Right, <laughs> right. 
No, no, you can't say bar none. I have to, I have to speak up on behalf of the Christian scientists. They uh-huh. have, they have weekly volumes of testimonies of their miracles, usually attested to also by a doctor or some other witness that they've collected for the last hundred years. And I, as I've said several times in this podcast, I almost never have to take my children to a doctor because the Christian Science methodology, which is praying to God, works. Okay, and uh, uh, someone busted my chops online saying, "Oh no, the Christians can't. The Christian scientists can't pray to God because they're they're not Christian." And I was like, "Look, it's in the name, buddy. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's nothing in there's nothing in the doctrine either of Catholics or Protestants that says." When someone who has different opinions about how the universe works prays to God and calls him by name and prays to Christ and calls him by name, that God will not grant his power to them. God will not bestow blessings on him. Okay, Mm -hmm. it does happen. I'm sorry. Prayer works. Yeah, I agree. Well, on that note, maybe we should wrap this up because we've gone a little long. (laughs) We have gone long, but I want to say one last thing. Sure, Not only does prayer works, but I am so much happier being a Christian than I was an atheist. Yes. As an atheist, I always had a chip on my shoulder. I was always so proud and arrogant with my nose in the air. Now, I'm still proud and arrogant, but I don't. I, I, I have a lot more fun being trying to be humble and, and failing. Uh, uh, I'm aware of my sins now, which is disgusting, but that actually makes me a lot happier than being unaware of them and thinking I was just the cat's pajamas. Uh, uh, I, I found friends everywhere. I'm a member of a group that I was never a member of before. I, I've got... I've got friends in the fifth century. Okay, I, I, Saint Justin Martyr is my hero. I named myself after him to, after I, after I got confirmed, because he's the patron saint of philosophers. Okay, and he was and he was basically talked into religion. The thing that didn't happen to me as a philosopher, I was not philosophically. Inclined. And the cathedrals are so beautiful, and this the uh, uh, so much of the West is tied into Catholicism. E- European history doesn't even make sense unless you understand. Christendom, unless you understand the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, so I'm happy to be home. I feel... I, mm. Everything I've always liked in science fiction and fantasy stories, that sense of wonder, that sense of adventure, that sense that you were a knight on a holy crusade, that's now real in my life. Okay? The the idea that there was something mysterious behind the appearances of the world, a, a secret power, okay, that's it, which is in all the stories I read. Well, that's true. The secret power is God. And he decided to pull a Saul of Tarsus on me. So he's got a sense of humor. He's yep. scary as all get out. Don't get me wrong. You should be God-fearing. But if you fear God, you will not fear man. And that will make your life a lot easier. Mm. Well, that seems like a good place to end. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we've opened a Substack, And we've made a few changes for Season 2. We'll be having guests, uh, guests on as well. Um, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to support us through Substack, uh, give us a look and um, we would be most appreciative. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining me, John. Thank you and amen. Amen.